Welcome to Let's Make the Future, a discussion about future trends, technologies, and their implications for human society. We are coming to you from all over the world. Brought to you by Fling.Asia, urban drone delivery. Get it fast. Fling it. Fling! This episode's future trend discussion topic, creativity with Jeremy Nixon. Welcome to Let's Make the Future. I'm Daniel Valenzuela. My name is Michael Alarm in War. I'm Michael Curry. My name is Hossein Kuhani. My name is Sarah Thalen. I'm Parnian. And today we have Jeremy as a guest here. Can you introduce yourself? I'm currently working on machine intelligence research at Google, at Google Brain. But I've spent time in the past year writing about abstraction and information processing, how to do concept representation effectively. And a lot of ideas for that book have been generated by this model for automating creative processes. I am very interested in basically finding the more general principles behind general of modeling, both in machine learning and in human thought, and behind creative concept generation. And I'm fairly excited about optimizing the process, both for humans and for machines. So this should be fun. So yeah, Jeremy, tell us, how did you get into all this creativity business? So I was at Harvard working on a lot of problems uh, around behavioral economics and trying to sort of create mathematical models of human heuristics and biases. And through quantification of our failure modes, start to do experiments that uh, would allow us to overcome some of those failure modes. And basically Basically, in trying to do problem solving in that environment, I found this podcast by somebody named James Altucher. I don't know if any of you have heard of him, but basically he had this habit where every single day he would, in a little notebook that he kept in his back pocket, set on a timer and generate 10 ideas in some contexts for a problem that he was working on, whether it was ideas for creating a new company or solving a particular problem, needing money, needing to find a person, needing to learn some skill, whatever it was, he would sort of take out this notebook, write down ideas in that subdomain and start to execute on them. And it actually started to change his patterns of thought so that his intuitive reaction to a situation was, oh, well, here's a problem. One frame that I have is I'm coming up with ideas that will solve the problem. And so he would basically sit inside of this, basically set of control and understanding frames. So control saying, you know, how do I basically modify the inputs to whatever the situation is such that I get the output that I want and immediately doing idea generation over that and turning that into a habit so that it was his intuitive reaction to a situation rather than being something that required effort or that, um. so there's this like, body of techniques that can exist outside of your mind where you actually have to actively do it. And it's much slower and less intuitive, and it's harder to integrate all of the knowledge that you have with that mental motion if you haven't sort of embedded it into your body of mental habits. And so... I was pretty impressed by the technique just because in planning and in problem solving, it's really valuable to say, take some goal that you have and generate 10 or 20 different ways of accomplishing that thing and then systematically execute over the paths to it. And a lot of the value that comes out of the generation of ideas is that there are sometimes pathways to a goal that can you know, shrink the amount of time it takes by 10x or by 100x. And sitting down and doing one of these for those goals is super useful for me. So when I was basically growing in college and, and starting to get into machine learning, I would basically use this technique to improve my ability to problem solve, to plan, and to generate ideas in spaces that I cared about. That sounds pretty cool. What was your experience with it? Like, did you follow the specific framework that you learned from Altucher? And if yes, did that work for you in that way? Yeah. So I think that there's this beautiful thing to time constraints. So I actually think of it as the sort of modular tool. So idea listing is one of my favorite techniques, I actually turned it into a daily habit. And that was really transformative for my creative output. The time constraint component of it is huge because as soon as you know you only have five minutes or 10 minutes to accomplish something, there is a pressure that's put on you. And so your ideas actually start to come more quickly. And there's this heuristic where like, if you're running out of time and haven't gotten to the mark, you should let quality fall. And quality usually looks like either expected value or volatility. So by volatility, I mean like how new or how different or how unusual is the idea that you're generating. Novelty is really valuable, say, in research, but may matter a lot less if you just care about executing. In that context, you just want the highest expected value. But as you sort of free yourself to generate ideas that have lower value because you just want numbers, you'll actually start to engage like subtly different mental processes where you let yourself freely associate between ideas that seemed strongly disconnected in the past. And so the time constraint axis is really nice in, in forcing action. I think it's really useful for journaling as well. 
Jeremy, I think we call that uh, desperation, don't we? When you oh, yeah. when you have a few minutes left, you desperately try to link a few concepts together. Maybe it works. Yeah, that's right. Well, it does activate a different process, which is great. I think we've all had the experience of coming up against some deadline and realizing that we actually have enormous amounts of self-control and ability to focus that didn't exist before. And that wishing that we could be inside of that time-constrained state more often. And I think that you can, you can just create a system where you time things and you disallow yourself from doing things outside of that time. And so put yourself into that state intentionally. I love the desperation state. It's very strong. It's very strong. (laughs) Jeremy. I'm curious about this, Jeremy, because I hear you talking about it and I'm like, this is an amazing coping mechanism for being under pressure. And that's kind of the ideal or positive way to respond to it. And so it's systematic as well. You're talking about systematizing creativity. But I'm wondering about those funks people can get in where you just, you kind of hit a wall and it can maybe be an emotional thing. And I was wondering if that was what you were calling a failure mode. Can you go into more details about the failure modes? Yeah, the upside to letting your quality bar slip is that it frees you from the funk. If you are open to everything, then you will actually start to generate bad ideas. But as you start to do the generation, you both realize that it's possible and you slip into a mode where you're basically like rolling with ideas and you actually get into this creative state of mind. And that actually is really, really helpful for funks. Often the funk is there because you have this somewhat artificial, extremely high barrier to entry for any idea that you come up with. And because you're putting that kind of pressure on yourself, it's hard unless you have the like reverse pressure of time pressure to force yourself to output things that are slightly suboptimal so that you can get yourself into a state where you're generating things that are actively useful. I would love to hear to put it into context, like an anecdote you might have, a personal yeah. one or one from someone you know where, you know, some of the quote unquote bad ideas they had that actually broke this wall down for them. Yeah, that's right. Oh no, how meta should we be? So one answer is that all of systematizing creativity was generated as an idealist. And so the origins of this project was somewhat meta. I also use it in research fairly often, but one of my favorites is in understanding how ideas propagate across networks. So I was reading a book by Richard Dawkins called The Selfish Gene, and I ran into this concept of a meme, which is a word that comes from the intersection of gene, uh, biological gene, which replicates, and mime, so to like copy. And so memes are basically the description of the way that ideas copy themselves as they move from person to person. And I was basically doing creative ideation over how memes operate. So for example, like I would come up with an idea like mimetic drift. So like memes start to get associated with the emotions they come around with. And so if there's a a meme that has some negative connotation, so say um, in the past, you know, people would refer to someone who's now African-American or Black as colored. And because there was like this negative association racially in the United States, that term started to have this like racial connotation. And so the people who wanted to mark themselves as not being racist moved to a term uh, Negro instead of saying colored. And now all of a sudden there was this distinction between memes. And I guess after everybody who was both like racist and not started using the word Negro, they moved to African-American and after African-American, they moved to Black. Basically, there's this drift in meme space due to the negative connotation associated with the idea. Or like also in memetics, you can watch memes buttress one another. So if two people have competing versions of it where there are two sides of a political battle, then they'll generate controversy that leads to huge arguments that ensue. But basically, I've been reading The Selfish Gene. This idea of memetics came up and I decided to idealist over ways to turn memes and memetics into a scientific field. And I ended up with a number of ideas, one of which was to create computational memetics through machine learning and natural language processing. So if you watch the way that ideas move across every social network, you can start to isolate the properties that ideas have and also the properties that people and communities have. And so there was basically a creative process that I ran over an idea in a book that I was reading that led to an interesting research frontier that has potential to put foundations under parts of social science. That's one fun example. I guess that um, if you look inside the sort of pre-indoctrination idea generation doc that I shared in the group, you can see seven examples of the use of idealists to generate ideas, whether it be in like machine learning research or finding contrarian positions on important topics or for learning in whatever domain you care about learning. There are a ton of heuristics for learning more quickly and efficiently, but also for problem solving generally. So I have a bunch of examples in that doc if you want to see. 
Thank you. I have an observation. One thing that I notice in science fiction, there's a trope that you visit a planet and it'll be a bunch of other people that kind of look like humans or aliens that look similar. Basically, every conception of the other or of an alien or of some different race, it still usually consists of a bunch of individuals. And that's what made, for example, the concept of the Borg in Star Trek kind of a powerful idea because it was a hive mind. So I feel like this idea of tracking ideas, how they evolve, how they get passed on between one another. You can call them memes or call them ideas or call them concepts. But it seems to me like when you study that, you're sort of helping to break down the difference between how mental processes work within the confines of one brain and then how they sort of start to mix and swirl around in the minds of many, many creatures. And so I wonder if we're often limiting ourselves when we conceive of systems and societies in the future as being collections of individuals when really the boundaries between individuals are not as straightforward as that. And we should really be modeling the future and how the future will look in a much more fluid sense where there's no real distinction between individuals and the full civilization because ideas are just going to get easier and easier to transmit between brain to brain. Yeah, that's right. And that transmission mechanism says a lot about what ideas propagate and what ideas don't. There's a strong simplicity filter, for example. And so overly complex ideas don't get communicated, or at least don't get communicated effectively. There's also a strong emotional need where you have to activate a desire to spread an idea in some other individual if you want it to propagate. And there's an emotional component to it. And inside of a single mind, you can imagine communication not being the bottleneck, but something else. And so I think that definitely a tool that allows you to communicate felt meaning, as opposed to like the particular way that you describe the idea should change things. So if you have a neural interface that lets you communicate immediately and intuitively, it can be pretty dramatic. There was a process of abstraction and generalization. I sort of asked myself, oh, like, what is this process? And why is it helpful? And what is it doing? And how can we basically find more tools that do the exact same thing. So there is a body of importantly different approaches to idea generation. And I think one of the most important is intentional diffuse mode. You can think of this as the state of free association when, you know, you're on a walk, when you're taking a shower, when you're about to fall asleep and you start to dream, certainly when you're meditating, definitely when you're on psychedelics. I guess there is a mode of thinking that allows you to freely associate ideas in different domains with one another without it being consciously directed. But what you can do is load up an idea or a set of ideas and then go take a shower immediately after. And your mind will move freely over those ideas and often will generate really unique and fascinating insights. And so doing that intentionally on a daily basis was actually amazing for my writing process. And I'm sure there are anecdotes about the shower insights that will lead to insights in physics, et cetera, et cetera. But I think that that mode of being is super useful. If you're falling asleep, there's this famous story of Thomas Edison habitually falling asleep with a rock in his hand inside of his chair so that he basically would let himself free associate over ideas for inventions. And then once the rock that was in his hand hit the ground, he would wake up. And he would wake up in this half dreamlike state where many ideas that had been floating around in his mind mixed together in unique ways and would run off and run whatever experiment he had just come up with. But certainly entering diffuse mode intentionally is extremely useful and came out of basically simple search for other categories of idea that also would let you generate novel thoughts. You have been reading and experimenting with this. I would assume, I mean, I can agree to that shower. I know like if I remember university where you had like assignments and then suddenly after having worked on a certain math problem for a week without any idea and then in the shower you suddenly solve it. But I would imagine that if you try to systemize it in that way and basically do something and then go ahead and take a shower right afterwards with the objective to get a good idea or get creative in some way, I would imagine that at least in my head there would be some buildup of pressure that would work contrary to what it should be, like the free-floating mind that you said. Do you have any experience with that? Yeah, the fact that Daniel's worry. Yeah, once I fall into the hot tub, it just feels amazing and I forget that I was supposed to be doing something. It's really hard to be surrounded by warmth and not basically lose the pressure. When I'm walking outside and it's gorgeous, I just notice that it's gorgeous and the pressure falls away. So I haven't really had practical issues with it. I think that if you're trying it for the first time, that might happen. But I, at this point, just feel like, yeah, going for a walk is relaxing. So at a practical level, it hasn't been an issue. Try it out and see if you feel that way. If you do, maybe it's an issue. But if you try it out and it's not, then you are free to just like freely associate and generate ideas. 
Can I also ask like a um, complimentary question? I'm wondering also, what are the other ways of putting yourself in those idea generation mode? Like shower is like one of them, but like how you can systemize that like process itself. So with Parni's question, I guess that how do you operationalize it? Uh, it's just like noticing that you will basically have some working memory sitting around. And if you load ideas that you want to do creative ideation with into working memory, the things that your mind wanders over first will be the things that you're thinking about. Very similar to the way that, you know, you're working on a math problem before you fall asleep and it ends up in your mind. It's really just in time associating it and then going and doing the diffuse mode activity, whatever it might be. Okay, I will definitely try that out. I mean, if I work on math after 9 p.m., I am very, very confident, at least in my experience from university and afterwards, that I will not be able to sleep for hours usually because my mind runs too quickly. Then. Maybe it's practice. <laughs> Maybe if you're days. lucky, you'll dream of it. Yeah. <laughs> also, I found that napping is actually better than sleeping for the most part. And it's often because it's easier to wake up in either REM or right before you go into deep sleep and have ideas. It's actually much better than trying to use like your late night sleep for creative ideation. I find that some fields are better for creativity than others. Like with mathematics and programming, I find that I get a bunch of nonsense ideas if I'm just sleeping on it. Like I find it's not very useful. It's better to walk through something very systematically looking at the mathematical problem on the paper rather than rely on my unconscious. But maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, well, I think that uh, math is also a harder case where there's a system and it's rigorous and it follows very concrete rules where if you're, say, writing or you're an author, the idea Ideas that you generate, say, in fiction can be far-fetched but emotional, and that is not something that like is right or wrong concretely. If you're brainstorming and you just need to filter, it also can be really helpful as just idea generation. But certainly when people are daydreaming, you know, when you're on a walk, when you're in a shower, it's much closer to rigorous mode. Like there are still controls in place in your mind to make sure that everything makes sense. And so it might make more sense to use those kinds of techniques if you're doing something extremely rigorous. I'm wondering like if you can have also any metrics that can figure out like what are your creativity modes are at the moment and also like figure out the spectrum of like people creativity and hype. So I think that certainly like abstracting over your problem or over your solution, that is like finding what kind of structure your problem has and finding it in many other problems or finding other applications of your solution and generalizing it to its farthest reaches is super useful. Basically, recombination of concepts is super useful. Will machines be able to become creative? How will it benefit them? So I have a research frontier in creative forms of machine intelligence. And a lot of it is actually downstream of better representations of the world. So there are a number of creative processes that humans go through. Some are intuitive, some are not as intuitive. Some are basically like a technique that you could run intentionally. And basically idea, say, in automating creativity is to do recombination. So if you want to find new ideas, you take sets of problems or solutions that already exist and you recombine those solutions with one another in flexible ways to work on some other problem. And the humans will usually say that some solution is creative if it's a solution that is on the long tailor that other humans had not thought of before or between domains that are not very similar to one another at first glance. So that recombination really just requires that you be able to represent the concepts inside of that machine and have those concepts interact with whatever problem it is that's being worked on. In a lot of ways, machines are better at doing basically discovery of structure inside of data. And so many problems will look like, you know, here are a number of data points. They all share particular types of feature, particular types of structure. And can you abstract over it and generalize to new data points? Basically figure out which data points is it similar to using some high level notion of similarity. And I guess the ability to basically train on a number of tasks and generalize to some other domain where you've broken up your understanding of the task into subtasks is something that humans do all the time that is totally implementable. And certainly many people at Google Brain and at DeepMind are working on doing this right now. So I think that um, a lot of our creative processes fall into these pretty clean categories in machine intelligence where it's like, oh, you know, what we're doing when we generate generalize can actually just be creative. And what we're doing when we basically recombine concepts can be implemented. Some things are much harder to implement. So I think that use mode free association is very hard to implement. Humans are very good at basically integrating all of the experiences that we have in the systems that exist in a shared mental space where they can sort of do cognitive fit 
between arbitrary domains. And it's very powerful and hard to replicate. So I guess it's hard to represent problems to a machine in such a way that it can see the overlap between all of them. There's this sense that you can make a metaphor between almost anything, and the human will pick up lots of subtle similarities and structures inside of that metaphor. And frankly, the metaphor is usually doing tacit abstraction, where there's some shared structure between two domains and the metaphor is connecting them, and we don't know how to point at exactly what that shared structure is. We just let it sit inside of the metaphor. So for example, yesterday talking to a Stanford researcher about his creative process, he pointed at doing a small experiment and then iterating over and over again. And that shows up in minimal viable products. It shows up in the scientific method. It shows up in Scrum. In the military, it shows up in Blitzkrieg. There are all sorts of metaphors you can make for that kind of process. And what you want is a label for that higher level process. And ideally, you would basically generalize to every problem that was well fit by that solution. And you start to figure out what kinds of problems are well fit by that solution. And when you do it over dramatically different domains, we'll say, oh, the computer is being creative in generalizing that kind of solution to that domain. So let me share a short talk that basically has a number of approaches to automating creative processes in machine learning. There are things that aren't in here. So I guess you can sort of see in the intersection between machine learning research ideas and systematizing creativity, processes that I think are actually hard to implement, at least in the short term. But um, that is a short attempt at an answer to the question of machine creativity. I guess that a lot of it's borderline implementable or already implemented. Cool, thanks. I wanted to ask this question about implementing creativity for machines. Can you bring an example, Jeremy, that it was successfully implemented and a task that the machine solved using some creative strategies? Mm, yeah, that frame is actually, um, in my mind, mostly about reference points where whether or not you call something creative is actually a function of your expectations. And so what usually happens is you implement some creative process inside of a machine and quickly people are like, oh, no, 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 no. That's actually just such and such an algorithm. That's not creative. And so there's this constant moving frontier, much like with the concept of artificial intelligence or with the concept of creativity. I think certainly almost all of machine learning looks fairly creative if you start to find the long tail, say, recommendations that work very well. So once you say our Amazon and have huge amounts of data on what people like and are comparing people to other people, you'll start to make extremely creative looking recommendations, things that people didn't expect that they would like, because it so happens that across the globe, there are thousands of other people just like them who happen to also like this other obscure thing. So I would point to almost all of those processes. It's a moving window. So I can tell you things and they may sound unimpressive, but a lot of problem frames look like they have creative solutions because the optimal solution is actually very unusual. So if you're doing a linear programming problem, really any optimization problem, there are going to be edges in optimization space that are your optimal solutions especially if it has a structure that can be fit into, say, a simplex. And so because you end up optimizing a loss function, you'll end up in like machine learning with all sorts of terrible behavior at the edges of your space where the AI will do something that optimizes its loss function that is actually very destructive. And that's actually very creative behavior because for the human, it's an unusual event. You didn't expect it to be framed that way. You didn't expect the problem to be viewed that way. But because you just set up this loss function and had your reinforcement learning agent optimize it, you'll say have a racing bot that actually just sits inside of the middle of the course collecting points because it found a way to collect points more quickly through that mechanism than through actually doing the racing game. So those are a few examples. I can give you a lot more, but that's a short answer. Jeremy really wants to do this uh, workshop, and I'm excited to see what that's like. Is a workshop like, is it use our individual problem domains and we're going to privately kind of work out things ourselves? Yeah, that's right. What's your suggested time frame, Jeremy? We can do it in 20 minutes. Yeah, didn't you hear uh, before, it's better to rush things, right? Time constraints. So. <laughs> the constraints are so helpful. They force you Away to go. Does everybody have access to the document that outlines all of these techniques and models for systematizing creativity? Yes, from the Facebook chat? Yeah, that's right. It's called Systematizing Creativity and Models of Technique. It opens with different categories of techniques, and inside each category, there are short lists of different versions of doing that technique. And it should be actionable. It should be specific enough that you can say, like, go ahead and do, you know, abstract and transfer over similar problems and solutions, or that you can basically do recombination over concepts. Seeing examples might also be helpful, but I think that if you go to the stock, you'll be able to see explanations and that'll ground things nicely. Okay, well, let's assume we're all in this document. So uh, take it away, Jeremy. So let's do this. I'm going to set a quick timer in the next two minutes. Each of you run through the models and techniques 
and choose one that you think will be interesting. They apply to different categories of problem. So there are some problems that social solutions work well for, like say crowdsourcing your creative process. There are some problems that you really just want to do an idealist over. So some are easier than others. If you are not sure, idealisting works for almost everything. Transferring and abstracting over similar solutions and problems works for almost everything. Diffuse mode works for almost everything. So you feel free to pick the top three if not. Yeah, choose one and basically read through the detail on how to do it. And it may be short, so feel free to ping the group with a slightly more detail on X if you think you're not sure exactly what to do as a result. And leading questions is pretty straightforward as well if you want to start generating ideas that way. So timer's on. I'll give you guys 40 seconds to think about it. All right, hopefully everybody has a tool or technique by now. So the next thing is to generate either problem or question or a solution that you'd like to generalize, but basically finding a target for the technique. So I'm going to give you guys 30 seconds to decide exactly what you should use it on. So open up a notepad or a drive document and write down basically your technique, how you expect it to work, as well as the target for the idea. 40 seconds more. So go ahead and do that. All right, that's time on setting up a doc and, and writing things out. So um, if everybody is set up, I'm going to give us eight minutes for actually running the technique on the problem, the solution, the thought, the idea that you had. So we have one question that we're supposed to answer, and then we're supposed to apply this technique to that question. That's right. I'm going to give us eight minutes, and then after we can share the results of our creative ideation, feel free to also do it over things that you don't want to share. You don't have to share. Uh, it can be private. Those are often much, much more interesting. I'm going to start in three, two, one. Eight minutes on the clock. Six minutes left. Four minutes left. Only two minutes remaining. Time. Creative process over. That was eight minutes on a technique. We only have uh, about five and a half minutes left. So let's do two shares if anybody is particularly excited and didn't do anything dangerous. And then we can have our last questions for me. Anybody excited about sharing? I'm excited. I thought of, I was using technique number eight with the leading questions. Yeah. And the problem I had was a lack of standardization of American Sign Language because there are a lot of debates over legitimacy of certain interpreting product in the deaf community. And so I tried to, I thought of the sacred beliefs, which were, you know, deaf people have entitlement to knowledge because of their cultural status when sometimes the cases their educational background doesn't afford them the linguistic knowledge necessary to make the assessment. Same goes for hearing people, obviously. And then I thought of working backwards. And if it were standardized, there might be a sort of police or governing body involved. And then I thought of the um, Institution Française. It's like that big French language police <laughs> that exists in France. And if something like that were to be established on like the university, Gallaudet University on a deaf university campus, that would be a really interesting idea. Mm, yeah, that's right. And if you wanted to create that organization, you could just do an idealist for basically the pathways. So I guess like if this or like the leading question, you know, if this thing existed, what would have happened and how can I actually make that exist? Um, does anyone else want to share? I can also share. I was thinking about creating the ontology of ideas and like the way that we are kind of like systemizing like our thoughts and creating an ontology because sometimes I feel like it's extremely a hard problem to organize your ideas. And I came up with like list of ideas, like one, for example, what level of like abstraction you want to go to detail, like when you have ontology, what are the traits of creating ontology would be. And then there was like, for example, what are when you are like thinking about the idea to creating all the ontologies and categories of those and then how you can essentially like a structure like generate like different ideas that is ground up also like you can essentially have many different types of input data for example in the conversation you're trying to find like many different categories or patterns then you should probably use different techniques than when you are like writing like freely in text whether you are just like trying to like like in many different activities like that we do and it would be really interesting that when you have many different types of input data, and then put it in some sort of like GAN system, and then you can just like automatically generate many different types of like anthology based on your input data. There are a lot more, but those are kind of like initial of those. Yeah, that's huge. So does anyone have last minute question? Thanks, Jeremy. I'm curious which of the models people chose to use in the workshop, actually. So I went ahead and did decomposition. So basically you take an idea in some domain and you try to break it down in multiple ways. And in this case, I had just done idea, some decomposition over idealisting. You know, intuitively in the conversation, that was my immediate mental motion. It's like, oh, you did the workshop as well, Jeremy. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. I was also, I was also being creative. That's right. Good for you. Um, but I noticed that I just started breaking down idealisting in conversation because I started to install that mental pattern of like, oh, well, let's break this into its subcomponents and maybe modularize it so that we can generalize on 
recombine the subcomponents into like new types of technique, but also understand like what psychological impact they have. And we talked about the psychological impact of time limits. So that was my choice. I did leading questions, just like Sarah. Yeah. Did you pick different ones? Which ones did you pick? I just walked through the whole list of leading questions. I think I got all the way to the point of what if questions. So I guess I got four down the list of 12. So yeah, anyone else have any other questions? Michael Alarnino? You know, there are a number of techniques, you know, you put out the uh, generate ideas. Have you been able to classify these techniques into what techniques work for certain situations? So for example, I saw one for social technique for uh, social solutions. Do you have them categorized into different categories for what techniques work for more science-based solutions? You know, what techniques work for when you're working with machines, for example? So there are 16 techniques and all of them work in totally different contexts. And so the answer will be very, yeah. very long if I try to give you my body of intuitions. I don't have a shareable, here are the things that all of the techniques are particularly useful for or are not particularly useful for document for you. And so I think that that's absolutely worth creating. It's actually on a Pathways doc. So there's a like Pathways for Systematizing Creativity document, which is basically in deciding what direction we should go with these ideas. And some of them are fairly inspirational. Absolutely feel free to like ping me if you have other worthy missions. There are already like 28 things worth doing with this. One of them is deciding basically like how to map techniques to tasks. And so I feel your pain. Maybe on that note, <laughs> I found it quite funny. In the workshop, what I chose was find a source idea, categorize it, and generalize it to finding more instances of that category. So basically, yeah. that's now, like reflectively, I did a very, very machine-like behavior by asking a question, coming up with like a starting point and trying to optimize from there by categorizing it into like different variables and try to optimize each one of them. So that sounds really, really <laughs> algorithmic. And the yes. question was, how can we get tech people excited for an exclusive event beer because we kind of have that issue right now in my co-living space. So I came up with a good solution I will present afterwards. I want to thank everyone. If you have more questions, send me on Facebook. Feel free to ping me. It was a joy to be here. Thanks, Daniel, for organizing everything, for setting everything up. Thanks very much, Jeremy, for your time and for your valuable input. That was super interesting. Yeah, thanks, everyone. That was really fun. Thanks, Jeremy. <laughs> thank thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Bye-bye. Bye. That was really good. Bye. Good, Bye -bye. good morning, Bye. good night. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> See you guys next time. Bye-bye. See you. Thank you. Let's make the future, featuring the voices of Michael Curry, Daniel Valenzuela, Jose Kuhani, Sarah Palin, Michael Oloranimo, and Parnion Barakatang. Music and editing, Christian Peltonen. Visit us online at letsmakethefuture.com.